trustee training. Hello, my name is Amanda Francis. I'm one of the partners in the Buzzacott charity team. We're going to be talking today about the Charity Governance Code. In our session relating to trustees' responsibilities, I explained why some of the issues faced by charities in recent years because of failures with regard to safeguarding, fundraising and other concerns essentially all stemmed from a failure of charity governance. In this session, we look at the Charity Governance Code. This is a way of looking at trustees' responsibilities from a practical point of view rather than a legalistic one. The Code of Governance is not a legal or regulatory requirement. There is no obligation on charities or their trustees to follow it or even use it. What it does do is it draws upon the Charity Commission's guidance in CC3, but it sets the principles and recommended practice. So it is deliberately aspirational. I'm always very skeptical if I am told that a charity complies with the governance code 100%, because I think there's always something that every charity can do just to improve certain areas. The code essentially was developed by the charity sector to help charities improve, to help them develop and evolve their governance. It was last updated a couple of years ago, where two of the principles were amended to take account of latest thinking and needs. Now, there are two versions of the code. The first, the larger version, is for charities with income of a million pounds or more and those whose accounts are audited. And it's that version that I'll be concentrating on today. But there is another version, a version for the smaller charities and those with income of less than a million pounds. Now, where charities do decide to adopt the code, whether it be in part or whether it be in whole, they are encouraged to refer to that in their trustees' report. It is good practice to identify within that report the parts of the code that perhaps you have deliberately chosen as a charity not to apply and to explain why, but also to highlight the areas of the code which are still work in progress for your charity. Now, the code itself is often depicted as a diagram in the shape of a house. That house has a foundation representing the basic fundamentals of charity governance or the trustees' role in the context of the charity. On that foundation are built six pillars or principles, each of which represents a key support towards the trustees achieving sound governance. Those six principles can be identified as leadership, integrity, decision-making, risk and control, board effectiveness, equality, diversity and inclusion, and finally, openness and accountability. And then the house is finished off with an overarching roof or a seventh principle, representing the key overall requirement of understanding organisational purpose. Essential if trustees are to demonstrate that they are fulfilling their role properly. Now we will look at each of these component parts in turn and consider what each means in practice. So let's begin with the foundation. What essentially this is, are the key attributes needed in a good trustee. And what the code says is that all trustees need to be able to demonstrate that they're committed to their charity's cause and have become a trustee because they want to help the charity deliver its purposes in a more effective, way for the public benefit. The trustees recognise that meeting their charity's stated public benefit is an ongoing requirement. It's not something that you can do once and then forget. Every year you need to be thinking about what could our charity be doing better to demonstrate that it's reaching the public, that it's benefiting them in a variety of ways. The code explains that being a trustee is understanding what your role is, and what your legal responsibilities are, and that you have read CC3. So the Code of Governance is not a replacement for CC3, it is there alongside it, as is the charity's governing document. And it's about trustees being committed to good governance, wanting to contribute to their charity's continual improvement. So that's the foundation. Now, if we go to the other end of the house, the overarching principle or the roof, and that is expressed as the trustees are clear about the charity's aims and ensure that these are being delivered effectively and sustainably. So what does that mean in practice? 
Well, it means reviewing the charity's charitable purposes and its work. Asking yourself, are these purposes still valid? Do they still work for today's society? Are there ways in which we should be changing? Are there aspirations that we have that we need to work towards? And therefore, is there an agreed strategy? Not just for the short term, but for the medium and the longer term. And how will we know when we have achieved that strategy or whether we're on course to, to get there? So are there clear milestones to measure the outcomes and the impacts to demonstrate that we're still on track? On track to achieve those goals, but also that you've got the financial resources to help you do so. And that means ensuring that you're happy that there are clear budgets and cash flows, not just revenue budgets, cash flows that are prepared on a rolling annual basis and ideally for slightly longer than that, for two or three years. And that they demonstrate that the charity's income and business model is sustainable. Now I know that budgets for longer term periods are often not thought to be useful because there is, I absolutely accept, an element of guesswork in them. But they are there to provide you with a guide and therefore certainly, I believe, worth pursuing and preparing. This principle is also about asking, are there more effective ways that our charity could work? And that's certainly something that all of us have been forced to think about really in the advent of COVID. COVID forces all to work differently, but it opened our eyes to possible opportunities of doing things differently going forward. There are also constant technological changes that we need to be aware of and that could bring in efficiencies and more effective ways of working. And finally, within this principle, is the need to review how your charity provides public benefit. This principle and what lies behind it are really the subject for a discussion, a discussion that may happen at a trustees meeting once a year, perhaps at the meeting at which your charity's strategy and budgets are being considered. And the purpose of that meeting would be to look back with a critical eye and think about what has happened over the past year or two and to ask, what could have gone better? What are the lessons to learn? How could we improve? Where is our charity heading? How do we get there? And what resources do we need? So that's the roof. The roof is held up by six further principles that form those columns. The first of those six principles is that every charity is led by an effective board that provides strategic leadership in line with the charity's aims and values. That's all about the concept of collective responsibility, the need to ensure constructive debate and discussion, allowing everyone the opportunity to give their views and then to reach a consensus on the point in question. That goes back to the point I referenced when we were talking about trustees responsibilities, about having an effective chair with a clearly defined written job description. And you may think, well, why does a trustee need a job description? Certainly your chair and any other officer, such as a treasurer, ought to have a job description. But as an aside, I personally think it's good always for trustees generally to have job descriptions to remind them what they are there to do. Now to go back to the role of the chair, that role is key to effective and well-run meetings. You need somebody who is able to summarize key points and decisions. Someone who is able to allow all to have their voice. Someone who encourages those who may be quiet to find their voice. Someone who allows debate, but knows when to draw matters to a close and how to prevent a debate turning into an argument. Someone who is fair, someone who demonstrates a skill for listening, but also has that firmness that is there when required. If you can find somebody within your trustee board who has all of those skills and therefore will be a really good chair, it will ensure that your meetings run to time and importantly, that adequate time is given to items that deserve it. So on your trustee agenda, there will be matters that perhaps are covered by paperwork and papers prepared in advance of the meeting, 
What the trustees meeting shouldn't be is simply you're sitting there and going through those papers. Those papers should be taken as read. And in some instances, that's all that's needed. Simply to nod that the paper has been read, it's been understood, and if necessary, there can be a vote if needed. The second requirement really of a trustee board is that they acknowledge that they have responsibility for the chief executive of your charity. Now, often in practice, that responsibility falls to the chair. The relationship between the chair and the chief executive is absolutely crucial. There has to be really good communication and openness between those two individuals. Effectively, the chair is the line manager of the CEO and will be responsible for that individual's performance review and so on. If that relationship works, and if there is that really good communication between those two individuals, then it should ensure that, for example, the meeting has well thought out agendas that cover the points that both trustees want to cover, but that management want to discuss. It should ensure that there are really good papers for the meeting, explaining the points, setting out the information that's needed to enable the trustees to come to a consensus and reach a decision, and it should ensure that there are good minutes. It should, if there is a good chair, ensure that there is adequate time for debate, that trustees respect one another's views, that there is support between trustees, but they constructively challenge one another on occasions. And that good chair and that good relationship the chair has with your chief executive will ensure that there is sufficient time at meetings for people to explain their views, for matters to be debated and discussed in a way that allows a decision to be made having regard to all the key facts. So that's the first principle. The second one is that the board acts with integrity. It adopts values, applies ethical principles to decisions, and creates a welcoming and supportive culture that helps achieve the charity's purposes. So what does that mean? It means that the charity's trustees are aware of the significance of the public's confidence and trust in charities. It reflects the charity's ethics and the values in everything it does. And trustees need to undertake their duties with this in mind. That means that at all times they should uphold the charity's values and maintain the charity's reputation and do everything they can to ensure that it is a good reputation at all times. In practice, that will mean always ensuring that your charity is living its values, that it's compliant with all laws and regulations, and occasionally standing back and thinking, how do people regard our charity? What's people's perception of our charity? And is it the right one? Should we be taking action to change those perceptions? It's about having good and up-to-date policies which are reviewed regularly by the trustees, discussed, and where the trustees are happy that those policies are being implemented. It's about ensuring the right to be safe, whether that be for your employees, your volunteers, or your beneficiaries. And it's about managing conflicts of interest. Now, the third principle is that the board makes sure that its decision-making processes are informed, that they're rigorous, and that they're timely, and that effective delegation, control, and risk assessment, and management systems are set up and monitored. One of the key tools by which a trustee board can do that is through a written scheme of delegation, setting out who has the authority to take what form of decision, to spend what sums of money, and at what level does it then need to be referred up. And importantly, what that scheme of delegation should also set out is the matters that the trustees believe are so important that they have to be reserved for the board. Only the board can make those particular decisions. Again, that scheme of delegation is something that needs to be reviewed on an annual basis just to make sure that it's up to date, that it's still working, that there are not issues with its operation. It's also, I think, important for trustees to remember that in practice, it's very difficult to discuss everything that needs to be discussed in four, six, however many meetings a year. 
And for that reason, you will find that most charities have a committee structure. So they may have an audit committee, they may have a finance committee. If you're a care charity, you may have a care committee. The important thing is that those committees have proper terms of reference that it's recognised that they cannot make decisions. They can make recommendations, but the decisions always remain with the board. And the membership of those subcommittees is equally important. So if you take something like a finance committee, the logic initially is to ensure that everybody who is on that subcommittee has some form of knowledge of finance or some form of accounting experience. In my time of dealing with finance committees, I've always found that perhaps the most difficult questions and perhaps the most important questions come from the member of that committee that isn't a finance expert. And so always when you're thinking about setting up a committee, yes, put the obvious people onto it, but occasionally have somebody who you wouldn't necessarily automatically assume would be fitted to that um, particular committee. Trustees or through their committees need to ensure that they are reviewing key contracts with third parties, that they're happy with what the charity is being committed to, whether that be a contract for the provision of services or the contract for the receipt of money, that you're happy with the key policies and the procedures, and that you're happy with the operational plans and the budgets. And that importantly, either trustees or the finance committee is monitoring performance against those and holding the management team or the executive to account. Benchmarking is also a very important tool that trustees might consider using. Not just financial benchmarking, but benchmarking in terms of KPIs, in terms of your operations and the work of the charity. So for example, if you are a charity that runs care homes, you might reference yourselves against the KPIs and the performance of other care home operators. They need not be charitable ones, they could be commercial ones, but sometimes it's important to make sure that you're on track and that you're basically following what um, your competitors are doing as well. And that's all part of reviewing and actively managing risks, identifying what can go wrong, identifying when you're going off track and pulling things together and making sure you've got the controls and processes in place to protect the charity. The next principle is that the board works as an effective team, using the appropriate balance of skills, backgrounds and knowledge to make informed decisions. So that's all about having regular meetings, a clear timetable at the beginning of each year with a set out programme of work. Within every trustees meeting, there will be what I would call business as usual, there will be things that are on every agenda. And that's the obvious things like, you know, looking at the previous meetings, minutes and so on. But it's also making sure that at each meeting, you've got a detailed report from the management team. Now, that could be a chief executive's report, but for larger charities, it may well be a report from your other directors as well. Certainly on every trustees meeting, there should be a report of the finances, where you are in terms of achievement of your budget and so on. But there will be occasional meetings where you have ad hoc items on the agenda. So that might be a report on a particular project, but it could be a meeting at which you're looking at those policies and procedures. It could be a meeting where you're thinking about, are we providing enough public benefit? How can we do that better? It's important that if trustees are going to be effective, that they need to take time to get to know one another, to actually not just meet four or five times a year in a formal setting, but to have a social get together, either before the meeting or after the meeting, to just get to know and understand one another's expertise, what makes one another tick. And however good a trustee board you have, as I've said before, you won't necessarily always have all the skills you need so it's a matter of accepting that you will need to take both in-house but also external advice. And an effective board, you need to think about the skills mix. Do we have the right people sitting around the table? Now, first of all, you need to think about how many people we have sitting around the table because more than, say, 12, you'll get into meetings which are not easy to control. But within 
the people sitting around that table, you need certain skills. So you need people who understand the work that your charity actually does. So if you're a care charity, you need people from the social care or the healthcare sector. You need somebody ideally with financial or business knowledge. You need somebody perhaps who has legal understanding and legal knowledge. If you're a charity that owns a lot of property, you will need a property expert. So think about those skills. And again, perhaps once a year, carry out a skills audit so that you know what you are lacking. And therefore, when you're recruiting new trustees, you can be looking for those particular skills. The other thing that's important is that your trustees can relate to the beneficiaries of your charity. So to be blunt, if you are a charity that is looking after children, you don't want necessarily all of your trustees to be age 70 or over. You want people who on a day-to-day -day basis are having contact with toddlers and young people. There needs to be a clear trustee appointment process. It doesn't matter if it's a word of mouth appointment process or whether it's a process by which you openly advertise for trustees in exactly the same way as you would do for employees. But it needs to be clear how you go about finding new people to sit on the board. And when you've found them, you need to have a really good initial, but also an ongoing induction and formation program. Making sure that they understand their legal responsibilities, but they also understand the work of the charity. So perhaps days where trustees actually visit the charity and have the opportunity to see the work in progress, to talk to the staff, to talk to the beneficiaries and get feedback in that way. The next principle is that the board has a clear, agreed and effective approach to supporting equality, diversity and inclusion throughout its organisation and in its own work and practice. What that approach supports is good governance and the delivery of the charity's organisational purposes. These days, it's not enough to just play lip service to equality, diversity and inclusion. You need to make sure that those principles are embedded in your organisation so that you are removing obstacles to people becoming trustees and participating in the charity. That's about thinking about the timing of your trustees meetings. If it, they're during the day, you may well be excluding people who perhaps are looking after children, people who are working and so on. So making sure that your trustees meetings are in a time that is going to be appropriate for the types of trustees that you want to encourage and attract. It's by carrying out audits of perspective, skills, experience, but also diversity, and carrying out an annual review on what your charity has done to address the diversity of its board, its leadership, against the objectives that you've set yourselves. So for example, if you're in the commercial sector, many of you will have heard of the 30% group which is basically a group of companies that are committed to actually ensuring that 30% of their boards by 2023 comprise of ethnic minority and female um, members. And that's the sort of objective that you need to be setting as a charity and ensuring that you're working towards it. It's about setting context specific and realistic plans and targets, and then taking action and monitoring your performance against those and not being afraid to publish how you're doing with regard to EDI and making sure that you are learning as you go along. And then we've got the, the principle that requires the board to lead the organisation in a way that is transparent and accountable. And that's all about the charity being open about its work, unless, of course, there is very good reason for not to be. It's about communicating with beneficiaries, with staff, with volunteers, with funders and donors, face-to-face -face meetings, through your website, through the trustees report, and via other publications, including social media. It's about being open about what you're trying to achieve, what you're not necessarily getting right, and therefore you're trying to, to take action about. It's about just talking about your plans and the exciting things that your charity is planning going forward, and where you need help. It's about reviewing negative and positive feedback. 
ensuring that there is a complaints process and that you're seen to be acting upon it. But it's also about some of the other things that charities may still be nervous about. It's about disclosing the remuneration of your senior staff. Now, you don't have to do this, but more and more charities are doing it because of some of the criticism that's been levelled at the charity sector about how much it pays some of its, its key staff. I don't think any charity, if it's thought through its remuneration policy, should be ashamed of it. It shouldn't be worried about being transparent about it and publishing perhaps some of the key salaries in the annual accounts. And one of the other things that the code encourages trustees to think about is whether they make available their minutes, whether that's in their entirety, probably not. But certainly in certain subsectors of the charity sector, you will have charities that make available extracts from their minutes. Again, for the process of being open and transparent so that everybody, whether they be staff, whether they be volunteers, can perhaps go onto the charity's intranet and see what their trustees are actually discussing and what decisions have been made. So, as I stated at the beginning, the code is consistent with the responsibilities of trustees laid out by the Charity Commission in its own publication, CC3. However, it is far more practical in its approach, giving real-life examples of how trustees can clearly demonstrate that they're fulfilling their duties. It isn't mandatory. But whether you follow it in its entirety or simply look to aspects of it for guidance, I think it's certainly a document worthy of consideration by the trustees of all charities. Thank you.